Christ our Lord on this blessed Sunday. Make us worthy to praise your resurrection with pure hearts and with clear consciences. With all the children of your holy church, we glorify and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and your children. Praise, glory, honor, and praise to the good and merciful Lord, who in his compassion came down to us and became flesh. He chose to taste death to save us, and he descended to the realm of the dead. By his resurrection he gave joy to his disciples and gave light to the nations with the light of his salvation. Good one, be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Word of God, how can, who can adequately praise you for the depth of your compassion? And what voice can bless you, for you are above all praise? Neither mind nor tongue can describe the wonders you accomplished on Sunday, the day of your resurrection from the dead. And so with the psalmist David we cry out, This is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice in it and be glad. Now Christ our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense which we offer you, to forgive our sins. Give peace of mind to those in distress and comfort to those who are anxious. Bring back those who are far and watch over those who are near. Guide the shepherd, sanctify the priest and purify the deacons. Pardon all sinners and guard the righteous. Protect orphans and help widows. Drive away all conflicts and put an end to dissension. Remember the faithful departed and grant them rest in your heavenly kingdom, that with them we may celebrate that eternal feast. And we raise glory to you, to your blessed Father, and to you living Holy Spirit forever. Amen. On Sunday. Receive the sweet fragrance of our incense and make us worthy to announce your resurrection with the angels, to proclaim it along with your women disciples 
and to rejoice in its victory with your pure apostles. And we raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Spirit of holiness, now and forever. Amen. with joy from the mountains Sunday is a feast so great offer praise to the Lord God and with angels celebrate First letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. But a poor of all. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and two children forever. Brothers and sisters, among human beings, who knows what pertains to a person? except the spirit of the person that is within. Similarly, no one knows what pertains to God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the things freely given us by God. And we speak about them not with words taught by human wisdom, but with words taught by the Spirit, describing spiritual realities in spiritual terms. Now the natural person does not accept what pertains to the Spirit of God. For him it is foolishness, and he cannot understand it, because it is judged spiritual. spiritual. The spiritual person, however, can judge everything, but is not subject to judgment by anyone. For who has known the mind of the Lord as to counsel him? But we have the mind of Christ. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Hallelujah. <laughs> 
Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Saint Luke, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Luke writes, At that very moment, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit, and he said, I give you praise, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, for although you have hidden these things from the wise and from the learned, you have revealed them to the little ones. Yes, Father, such has been your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal him. And turning to the disciples in private, he said to them, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I say to you, many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. This is the truth, peace be with you. I give you praise, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. So this is chapter 10 of the Gospel of St. Luke. And there are a number of things that St. Luke covers that are not in the other Gospels. For example, the Annunciation, all of the episodes that deal with the Blessed Virgin Mary and the birth of the Christ, these are uniquely in the Gospel of St. Luke. He clearly interviewed the Blessed Virgin Mary, and so he gives testimony of someone who can only personally have known it. But one of the other things we have is also the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, it may seem strange to us that something that is so famously known is actually only recorded by one of the four evangelists. But the parable of the Good Samaritan is actually in this chapter 10 of St. Luke. So when we look at chapter 10, what St. Luke is actually about is the one thing necessary. What is life actually about? Why do we exist? Because it begins with our Lord choosing the 72 disciples, sending them out two by twos. They go out into all the villages and they prepare for the coming of our Lord. They dispose the ground, they teach, and also we see they work miracles. And the very end of the gospel, the end of chapter 10 of St. Luke, is the famous episode of Martha and Mary. 
and our Lord being in Bethany. And with Martha running around getting everything ready for dinner, and Mary is just sitting next to him, just listening. And so Martha's running around in the kitchen. She's trying to get things on the table. And Mary's just sitting and listening and learning from our Lord, the one thing necessary. Again, a very famous episode in which Martha just basically says to our Lord, why don't you tell Mary to get up and leave the living room and come and help me? I'm doing this all by myself. And we recognize a very human story. My cousin never does anything. She's always just sitting out there. Once again, another Thanksgiving, she's not doing anything. And yet, it's really not about Mary not doing anything. Mary's listening to the Word incarnate. Mary is listening to our Lord. So that's the difference. It's not just a Thanksgiving Day story or Christmas story or anything. Mary is actually listening to learn. She's not trying to avoid working but she has chosen the one thing that is better, which is to follow the Lord, and she's listening to this. And our Lord doesn't rebuke Martha in the sense that what she's doing is wrong, but he does reorder her priorities. That's why he says to her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious for a lot of things. You know, you could almost imagine in parentheses, and your house is always lovely, and the meals are always wonderful, and you are you are an excellent hostess, which is why I always stay in your house when I'm in Jerusalem, because that's part of the story also, is Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, these two sisters and brother, that's the house that our Lord always went to when he was in Jerusalem. They gave him refuge, especially when things became very heated. So clearly he loves Martha, but he wants her to reorder her priorities. They're wrong. You should have actually have come to me and said, I am so profoundly jealous of my sister because she can sit and listen and learn, and I'm busy. But she doesn't say that. She's more concerned about the work. And this is why our Lord is reworking her priorities, the one thing necessary. And he says that Mary has chosen the better part. She's chosen the better thing. And this will not be taken from her. Once this meal is done and the dishes are cleaned, it's done, it's gone. Mary will leave this house edified and three steps forward in the spiritual life. It's not to say that the beautiful meal wasn't beautiful, but it needs to be put and judged in the place that it deserves to be and not letting it surmount the one thing necessary, the better part, as our Lord says. And so that's the end of chapter 10. And the reason why I link it, this question of the reordering of our priorities, is we go back to the beginning in which the disciples are sent out, 72 of them sent out in pairs to go all around the towns. And they go in and they work miracles. They cast out demons. And they come back and they are so pumped. Because even the demons, even the, the, even the spirits of darkness were subject to us. And our Lord listens and he says, yes, I have seen Satan fall from the heavens. And when he sends them out, he says, he who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. That's not what they're thinking about. They're thinking about, these are awesome powers. This is great. Wow. Everyone in the village knew we were there because this is terrific. And our Lord tells them, slow down. Remember, this is the beginning of the chapter. He tells them basically to slow down and not to rejoice in those things. Those are only means to an end. Your end and the purpose is to prepare for the coming of the Christ, not casting out demons. Casting out demons is just to dispose the ground. It's not the purpose. And that's why he says, you rejoice in these things, but rather you should rejoice that your names are written in heaven, right? that your names are written in the book of life. And so again, he's reordering priorities in people's heads because we do this. We recognize Martha and Mary, and we recognize the disciples because we like things when they work out well, according to our judgments. But the Sacred Heart is always trying to rework our sense of priorities. If we are not a saint in the unitive state of mystic life, 
in which everything is submitted to God's will on a habitual manner, then we always have something in our lives that have to be reordered, set in proper proportion, judged correctly. And so there's a beautiful framing on this chapter 10 of the one thing necessary. And so when the disciples come back, he says, it's actually your calling and your names written in the, in the book of life in heaven to be, as it says in our anaphoras, to be among the firstborn who are enrolled in the heavenly Jerusalem. Very beautiful imagery. But again, he's making them understand what is first in this. And that's the context in which we're told in today's gospel. And at that hour, he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that while you have hidden this from those who are learned and complex and well-educated, you have revealed all of these things to the little ones, to children, because this has been your gracious will. This is stunning, because you don't have to be brilliant or educated to have your purport, you have your priorities straight. In fact, sometimes being educated and learning is precisely what screws up your priorities. And so our Lord says, this is God's gracious will. And you see again and again, he keeps saying, Father, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, Father, you have done this. And that's the second point that I want to bring from this chapter is on fatherhood. Of course, it coincides beautifully with Father's Days today. But what is a father? We ask the question, what is a father? I mean, these days he's reduced to a biological donor of gametes. And hopefully that apparently in the, mind, in, the, in the mind of today's culture will eventually become excluded as being anywhere necessary at all. Who knows? But when we ask, what is the Father, what is he doing by revealing? What is his gracious will in revealing? Because even though our Lord is talking about God the Father, the unseen, the hidden Father, origin of all things, he's still talking about what fatherhood is. And you, gentlemen, and I, all of us, every, every man who's, who's created into this world is meant to exercise a fatherhood. Some will be married in a physical manner, and some will be through a spiritual manner. No one is allowed to be on their own. And when our lives become on their own, for whatever reason, sickness, death, health, whatever, it's always going to be something exceptional because God had placed Adam and Eve on earth to be fruitful. So that's one thing we know, that fatherhood is about fecundity. It's about fruitfulness. It's about life. Now, obviously, the way the father exercises fruitfulness is going to be different from the way a mother exercises her fruitfulness. They're obviously complementary, and they're meant to be related to one another, but they're different. But both are about life and the giving of life. So on this Father Day, when we ask the question, what is our Lord glorying in his Father for? It's revelation. It is manifesting his will to the children, to those who are simple and disposed to learn. I remember I was visiting a few months ago at Mount Mercy, and it was lovely talking to one of the teachers. But she was actually mentioning how it was difficult, her grade she was teaching, because it was such and such a grade. And she had preferred like the fourth graders. Because the fourth and the fifth graders still wanted to please you. In other words, they were still listening. Six, seven, eight, well, okay, it's a little more difficult. High school, uh, they're so messed up, they don't know the top from the bottom. So they're not even actually listening. But the littlest ones, They'll listen. I mean, they go off into their own little la-la land uh, that they're in their heads. Yes, that's just normal. They're children. But they're also disposed to actually hear things, right? They bombard you with questions. Why is this? What is that? Where did this baby come from? All of these things. That's what our Lord means when he says that it's just your gracious will to reveal these things to the little ones, though that's been hidden to the educated and the learned. In other words, God's will is open to those who actually have ears to hear, who are listening. And so when we look at the first aspect of what is fatherhood, it's really education. What is fruitfulness about? 
When we talk about parents being the primary educators of their children, that's absolutely true. But between the two of them, the fathers have the first foremost responsibility to that education. This is by natural law. Everyone's understood this. Even the pagan Romans knew this. Moms took care of their babies when they were babies, but that's it. Six, seven, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Out of the way. And dad would just grab these kids and begin their education. Make sure that they're either going to apprentice, whatever trade or profession or career or whatever they're going to be doing. But the fathers knew this is my first responsibility, is to lead my children into strength and power and knowledge of another generation. This is why the Romans had the power of right and death, of life and death over their children. We look at that and we're horrified. And, you know, and so we should be. Of course, we have to also say that even for the pagan Romans, to execute or to sell off one of your children into slavery, you actually had to have a family council before you did that. That was the theory. You had to meet with your brothers, your cousins, and the other men before you decided and sold off that, that one extra girl you have. That's a horrifying thing. But the reason why I bring it up is why was there such an intense power among the Romans? It's because they considered the Roman fathers to be the very center of the entire culture of Rome. And then if the fathers did not exercise their responsibility, you have a disaster in the next generation, and that is the collapse of the city. That is the collapse of the culture. That is the collapse of the community. And they weren't wrong in thinking that. But because they were pagan, things are exaggerated and they're twisted. But the idea that the fathers have an absolute responsibility to educate and to lead and to guide and to establish the next generation, they weren't wrong on that. Now, we have a generation now of fathers who just sit around and watch video games while their children just flounder all over the place. We now have two generations of young men who have no idea even what it means to be a man, let alone the responsibilities of educating another generation. This is very sad. And so what's the question when we ask, what is the first aspect of fatherhood? It's education, guidance, it lead. The second part of it is they have to be consistent. Leading and guiding periodically is fine, but it's totally unhelpful if it's just on and off or up and down, usually depending upon what my mother or my father's mood is in. This is a disaster. Because then the children don't actually learn except to learn how to observe emotional states. And to learn, I'll ask this question of dad because he's in a good mood or he's in a bad mood, so I'll hide. That's a terrible education. That's a manipulative education. And so when we look at fatherhood, who is consistent in eternal origin of all things is God the Father. And St. Paul talks about all fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named after that one reality. So when you look at the gospel today, and I encourage you to read all of chapter 10 of St. Luke, it's about our priorities. What are the first things in our lives? The second thing will be, what is actually the guidance and the education that we're supposed to be giving? And this is primarily for the men on Father's Day. But St. Paul will add a third principle in the letter to the Ephesians, and that I'll, I'll leave you with. When he talks about the union between husband and wife, and everyone in the 20th century seemed to start getting obsessed with the one phrase where it says, women be subject to your husbands, and that's it. That's the only thing they remember of chapter five of the letter to the Ephesians. Of course, they forget the qualification to be subject to your husbands as the wife is subject to the church, as the church is subject to our Lord. No one thinks of our Lord as dominating and beating up the church. So the word subjection clearly doesn't mean slavery. But that's where we obsess about certain things, which are really distort the whole teaching. But we totally forget about the section about the man, where he says that husbands, to love your wives, to love your families, as Christ loved the church and offered his life for it. So what is the third element in fatherhood? Crucifixion. What is the third element in this 
education and consistency to bring another generation of life into the world? Crucifixion, self-sacrifice. And that's why having a generation of men who apparently have nothing else to do but to pour billions of dollars into a stupid industry of video games, obviously all the time they're spending in front of the community, they're not actually educating another generation. They're not giving guidance. They're not leading. You know, my father bought me a really crappy car for my first car. He spent a hundred bucks on it. Well, it's 40 years ago, but... And at the time, when the car was new in the 60s, it was a, actually a very beautiful car. Buick Skylark. Electric seats, mind you, 1960s. But it also meant everything was falling apart on it. It was nine years old. And this man bought this car. Even though he worked full time, had a family, a young family, youngish, they were teenagers, knowing that this car was going to fall apart. Because he was going to make sure that his 16 year old son understood that there's nothing magic in a car. It all works logically. Which meant this man that was going to night school for architecture, working full time and working overtime and with a young family, did something in his life that he knew he was going to spend those one moments on Saturday when he had a few hours free, he was going to spend Saturday after Saturday after Saturday in the garage showing how to fix a car to his son that he bought the piece of garbage for. Now, I'm a bit sentimental on this since my father died two years ago, but when I look back on that, and that's not the only thing he ever did, that was fatherhood. And I will say it's because of that notion of priorities being straight, of education, and being consistent, and also being crucified for the next generation. He fulfilled all of those obligations, even though he wasn't a fantastic Catholic. But he was a fantastic man. And remember on the natural law, fatherhood, you don't have to have revelation. When you have revelation, you do it beautifully. But gentlemen, even with the natural law, we have no excuses. And so for those who have brought another generation of life into this world, I congratulate you. And may God lavish his lum most luminous blessings upon you and upon your families. And as it says in the Old Testament, may you see your children's children to the third and fourth generation. But by all means, persevere, educate, be consistent, and embrace the cross of crucifixion to bring that generation of life of fruitfulness into a next world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Itenvot madem he daloho, walvot aloho dem hade tayot, wainem sugo taivota, keulal bai tochves kude prayak lo, hod kude shochem. upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, Saint Leoncius, and Hippatius, and Theodolus. Be mindful, O God, of the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Be mindful also of all those who share with us today in this offering.
continue with the Anaphora of the Twelve Apostles on page 754. 754. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Merciful and only Lord and Father, and through your only begotten Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Receive the offering of this unbloody sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. to you, holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, our minister of God. Peace to you, our server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give a greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to God. Peace, love, and faith. O oh Lord, may your peace and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives, that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Amen. O oh Lord, we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy. Make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies, that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify and proclaim. For our salvation, your own Son and Son became flesh of the pure Virgin Mary, and by his divine plan, he saved and redeemed us. Waksu ya bin talmi tao koro mara Sabahula mehne kulhun Hono deni tao Fahro diela Dahlo faikun wahlo sagi Mete kuseu mete heb Usoyam Hame wa hoye dan kaila malami. Ah, ho kano al kosa dam sihu min hamro min mayo. Parehu kadesha. O ya bin talmita koro mara Sabish tawa mehne kulhun Honun 
tenita de mon dilan dianti ki khadato dakhlo fai kun wakhlo sagiem et sharu metihab usoyon khambe wa khayidan qalam alamin Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do so in memory of me until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May people, we remember your plan of salvation, and we ask you to have mercy on your worshipers, and to save your inheritance when you appear at the end of time, to reward all people justly according to their deeds. For this your church implores you, and through you, and with you, implores your Father, saying, sinful children receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them we praise you we bless you we adore you we glorify you we profess our faith in you and we ask you to have compassion on us O God and mercy on us and hear our prayers how awesome is this moment O my beloved for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. The stand with reverence as we pray. Manin Murio, Manin Murio, Manin Murio, Nite Moro Hayu Kodisho, Onachen the line of Al Kurbono, oh no. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies, and the strengthening of consciences so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. We offer you, O Lord, this divine sacrifice for your church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith. With blameless lives and with purity and holiness, may they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have presented these offerings. Forgive them so that they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them. For you are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen the Archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith, who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Be mindful, O Lord, of the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest hoping in you awaiting that life-giving voice calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed and forgive the sins we have committed. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. O Lord, you are the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory forever. Compassionate Lord, may we, your lowly servants, be made worthy to pray with purity and with holiness and to call upon you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are thine now and forever. Yes, O Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways. And do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us. For yours is the kingdom, with your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo elukul chudnam. Wa'am u'kol ilom. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and with holiness, that through them we may be forgiven and be made holy, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. 
the grace of the most holy trinity eternal and consubstantial be with you my brothers and sisters forever and with your spirit let each one of us look to god with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion holy gifts for the holy with perfection purity and sanctity one holy father one holy son one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you 